session is my mixed bag of writing tips and experiences, <laughs> which basically is just that. It's kind of like a lady's purse when you travel, you just throw everything in there. There's no organization, you just dump everything in there. Um, I first got my start in the music industry, writing music about um, <clears throat> about 15 or 15 years ago maybe, and I started by writing solo piano books. And I did that for, um, for, for a while, and then Joe came to me one day and he said, well, would you try, Joe Martin, I'm sorry, would you try your hand at writing some choral music or arranging some choral music? And I said, okay, I'll try my hand at that and we'll see where that goes. And that just really kind of took off, and that is now um, probably where I spend most of my time in this industry, is just writing choral music, um, arranging choral music, and... So that's what I do. I was a church uh, pianist for many, 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 most of my life. Um, and I was on church music staff for uh, 14 years. So um, writing for the church is, I feel, one of my biggest callings. I feel like I serve God by serving the church in this area. And so um, that's a little bit of a background. I mean, sometimes people ask me, when did you first get your start writing music and arranging music? And my very first... My very first attempt was between my sixth and my seventh grade year of school. So I was, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old. And um, would you mind shutting the door for me there? Oh, we still have people coming in. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. And so, um, you know, youth groups, they usually go to summer camp for a week at a church camp or something. And so I went and I found out that you could sign up for a little music competition. They had sports competition and all these different things you could sign up for. And so I signed up for the music competition and I signed myself up for a piano solo, which was a Dino. Do you guys remember Dino? Mm -hmm. um, if you're below like 35 years old, you're like, I have never heard of Dino. <laughs> but he was like the piano god of my generation. So I I played his Near to the Heart of God at his little piano competition. It's the book where he's wearing like the royal blue suit with the white piano, the big wings and the big poofy hair, which is I guess kind of all of his books. <laughs> um, so I got up there and I played it and uh, I got third place. The girl who beat me was a 16 year old. She had curly red hair, freckles, blue eyes, just cute as a button. And she played this phenomenal piece. And I um, I knew she cheated. I knew she cheated because she got up and she announced this amazing piece as her own original arrangement. And I thought, there is no way that a 16-year-old girl can create something like that. You know, the only composers and arrangers that I knew were either really old men or they were dead. Yeah. And so certainly a 16-year-old girl could do this. And so I decided I was going to go home and I was going to beat her at her own game. I was going to come up with my own truly original arrangement and um, come back and win the next year. And so I did. I went home and I created this, um, which, by the way, I'm sure she was telling the truth, you know. <laughs> I, I hadn't quite learned how to listen to the Holy Spirit's little voice <laughs> in my head at that point. I'm sure she was telling the truth, but I didn't believe it at the time. And so I went home and I created this, this arrangement. And I, you guys are going to be blessed because I remember a little bit of this arrangement. I'm going to play it for today. <laughs> I'm going on a memory of, I'm not going to tell you how many years it was, but it was, uh, it was wonderful. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. because you know, I don't know that I had anything right there, but um, it, I realized that I loved creating, and I loved writing, and I loved arranging, so that's kind of how I got my start. Sort of, um, sort of Christian Victor Borga. Sort of. and there you go, I guess so. It was, it was pretty <laughs> awful, and I played it for my home church, and of course it was this little, this little southern church, and they just ooh and ah over anything that you know, a young person would do, and so they gave me a lot of encouragement. 
And um, I lived off of that encouragement for a while, and then I, you know, continued to edit myself and learn and grow. And um, so I have a confession to make. This is the first time in hundreds of sessions that I have taught where I have left all of my notes at my hotel room. <laughs> but <clears throat> so I took your, I took the worksheet that you had this morning, and I scribbled in the answers. So um, and I had all of these beautiful illustrations for all of my points that I might not remember, but I'm gonna do my best at giving you um, what, what I had planned. The beauty of something like this is that normally when I go places and I talk about composition, it ends up being more of a question answer time. Um, and so I really would like that. There are, this is such a broad topic on which to speak that I think that um, the things that I had planned might not be the questions that you had in mind. And so please ask me at any point, you know, whatever it is that you came to learn from this session, if I'm not talking about that, ask. Please ask, and I will answer the best that I can. If it's about the music industry, I can answer questions about that. If it's about how to be published, um, I can talk about that. Um, you know, anything that you want to know, raise your hand and I'll do my best. Or just shout it out. You don't have to raise your hand. This is not kindergarten. <laughs> okay, so my point number one. Know for whom you are writing. Uh, anytime I sit down to write anything, that is the first thing that I decide. Know for whom you are writing. Whether this is your own home church, um, you're writing for your choir. Uh, you know the voices in your choir. You know that you have a tenor that can't hit anything above a B flat, which technically is not a tenor then. <laughs> but that's the tenor that you have. You know he can't hit anything below an F either. So you know that that is your tenor. So when you're writing, you make sure that you keep your tenor note in that four-step range right there, okay? Or um, if you are writing for a collegiate-level ensemble, of course you have a lot more freedom then, and that's a lot of fun. Um, I write a lot of commission pieces, you know, churches will contact me, hey, our 100th anniversary is, you know, or we're, we're honoring someone who's been in ministry here for the past 50 years, and would you write a piece honoring that person? And so I ask a ton of questions, you know, I want to know how large your, um, <clears throat> I want to know how large your choir is or your group is, because that will determine a lot of things, you know. Um, I ask, can you give me a breakdown of the four parts? And then I ask, for well, what is the reading skill level of your musicians? Can they handle syncopations? Can they not handle heavy syncopations? What is the skill level of your accompanist? Um, what styles are you comfortable singing? Do you have any pop voices, or do you go with, or do you have a uh, just a? <clears throat> a barn burner legit baritone you know tell me everything you can about the ensemble that I am writing for because I want to write to that group's strengths anytime you write to someone's strengths it's always going to make them sound good and that's what you want to do you want to make that group shine if you write a piece to their weaknesses they will never use the piece um, or they will do the piece very poorly and then decide to never do the piece again. <laughs> so um, know for whom you are writing. That is crucial. That's, that's even if you are writing for an orchestra. Case in point, um, <clears throat> the, the first night when we did the reading session with instruments, I don't know if you all were there, the Psalm 121 that we did, originally I wrote just uh, strings, French horn, and some timpani mainly because there wasn't room in the budget for another orchestrator to do a full orchestration, and we didn't have room in the budget at that point to do a full recording session with the full orchestration. So I'm like, okay, let's see how full I can make this sound with just a handful of instruments. But then I found out, okay, well, we're going to have a full orchestra at some of the events where I'm presenting this piece. I'm going to go in, tell me what instruments are going to be available at Baylor, Okay, I'm going to go in and I'm going to write and rearrange all of this to fit all of those different instruments that you have right there, and then you end up with something that's custom fit just to that group. So know for whom you are writing, and that will really help you. That's the most important thing that you can decide right at the very beginning. Okay, number two. People ask me all of the time, um, <clears throat> you know, how do you know what to write? What is your inspiration? And I always tell them, write what you know. Right, you know, we all have a different perspective. 
um, truth is truth is truth, right? The truth never changes. Some people believe that there's no absolute truth, and I'm not one of those people. <laughs> um, so truth is truth. And I can be standing back there looking at the truth, and it's still truth. Or I can be standing over there looking at truth, and it's still truth. I can be up here looking down at the truth, and it's still truth. And so writing in your own style really has to do a lot with your perspective, where you're standing, where you're looking at the truth. And so we can write all about the same topic. We can choose a scripture verse, and I can hand out an assignment and say, okay, I want you to write something um, based on this scripture verse, and it's going to come out very, very different. Not just musicality, but it's going to come out very different, just the angle that you take. For instance, one of the songs that I wrote a couple years ago um, basically was a play off of um, the verse in Everything Give Thanks, and yet I don't think I talked about everything or thanks at all in there. The name of the song is Raise Your Hands. Oh. Where in every situation that we are in, uh, we raise our hands to God. When we are bowed low to the ground, we raise our hands. And so I was writing from a different perspective on that verse because that was kind of where I was living at the moment. Um, so write, write from your own experiences. The world does not need two of anybody. Um, you know, we don't need two Joseph Martins. And that's not a cut on him. It's just that God created us as individuals. And you are going to have the strongest voice in your writing if you write from your own perspective of the truth. Um, not only did God create us to be, um, not only did God create us to be individuals, you know, we're each one of a kind, he also create, created and crafted this, this very unique journey that he's going to lead us on, that nobody else will live that journey. And something that I found was very interesting to me as I was studying and I was thinking through this point was that um, <clears throat> it's not who we are so much that dictates how we write. Um, you know, because we're all different. You know, it's not, and it's not even shared commonalities in who we are. Um, you might like John Grisham books like I do, you know, just kind of mindless reading. Or, you know, we both have a love for this kind of pizza. Or we are both have the same sense of humor or whatever. And it's not even who we are on the inside that dictates the best writing. The best writing actually comes from external um, events that shaped our journey. And that was kind of surprising to me, that it's not who I am on the inside so much that affects my writing. It's what God has allowed me to live through and the places that he has taken me that dictate where most of my writing comes from. And every one of you has a different journey like that. And so write from that. And I think that you are going to have people that respond to your music. They're not going to respond to your music because of who you are so much as, hey, I've experienced that in my life too, and God has led me through a similar journey. Right. And when I get emails from people, some people say, oh, I love your chords, or I, I, I really like how you did this and that, that would be a small percentage, and I do get that, but most of the emails that I get are from people who say, it's like God brought you along in my journey with me. You know, I know that the circumstances are a little bit different, but I relate so much in my journey to what you're writing about. So it's really your external journey that dictates a lot of what you're writing. Okay, number three. Um, know the sweet spots of different voices and the changing timbre as voices and instruments move through different registers. That's really, really critical. Changing, right? Um, the sweet spots and the changing timbre. Amber. Mm -hmm. You know, for a, for a soprano, you know, not only knowing their ranges is, you know, we all need to know ranges of different voices, and that's going to change somewhat between choir and individuals, but there's, you know, generalizations. But sweet spots are when you go to build to that really big moment, sometimes the top of their range is not going to be their sweet spot, because you have sopranos that they can hit a high, a easily, but it's going to be a little bit shrill, and it's not going to just soar. You know, some of them might, but sweet spots are when you get to that big moment. You want everybody in their sweet spot. So a, a soprano, the sweet spot 
it's not the top of their range. It's going to be uh, probably around a, a D to an F-ish. That's where you put them on that, and it just sails easily. There's, there's, it's effortless energy, kind of. In alto, it's going to be... Um, <clears throat> Sweet spots are going to be more around, you know, the F to the A, A flat-ish. Um, and this, that's a little bit iffy depending on which group you're in. Tenors is going to be similar to sopranos. They're going to just soar around the D to the F range. Just effortless energy. Not shooting for something when you get into a G. You know, some tenors that's going to be effortless sweet spot, but you're going to have a lot of tenors that are really reaching for that. Um, basses, they're sweet spots where you're going to have that just that big energy moment. They can have that right around even a G, a G going to a C. After the C, they're uncomfortable, but they can lock in with the tenors at a D. Now, here's the thing, is that when you are working with, um, when you are working with, a contemporary ensemble, the sweet spots change as opposed to if you're working with a traditional or legit ensemble because you put a contemporary group in a contemporary song and you've got a soprano on an F, which in a traditional choir would be a sweet spot, all of a sudden you've taken that contemporary ensemble and you have changed their style. They're now that ah! when you don't want them to be that because that's a different thing. Now for tenors, it's different. A tenor can take that sweet spot all the way up and still sound contemporary. Um, it doesn't work with baritone, so um, going low. I remember a couple years ago, I was working on a song called The Scandal of Grace. Um, it's a more contemporary song. And it starts with a solo that was kind of, it was kind of low, but it also went, you know, to about a, a D. And so you've got something that's down on a, a, you know, a B flat to a D. And that's a big range for a soloist. And so we were trying to decide who to assign that to. And someone um, in my publishing company said, oh, give that to a baritone. And I said, mm, no, because you get a baritone down in those B flats, which are you know, great, but they're going to have this very legit sound, like uh, George Beverly Shea or you know, something like that, which is going to be beautiful, but that's not the style of this song. So you need to know those things. You need to know where the sweet spots are. You need to know the changing timbre of voices and instruments as they move through different registers. Where are they going to become shrill? Where is it going to be just power notes with without a lot of effort? Like I said, those are the sweet spots. When you, when you are writing in that big moment of your song, keep sweet spots in mind. Now, um, basses and altos. You can take them out of their sweet spots a little bit in big moments if they're singing unison with the sopranos and the tenors. So when I'm creating a huge, a huge moment, and sometimes unison creates a huge moment, um, <clears throat> I will put them all the way up on C's and D's. Uh, every now and then I might even go up to an E flat, which makes them very uncomfortable, but they are locking in with the power sweet notes of the sopranos and tenors who are gonna carry that and it's this amazing sound. And I'm careful to not leave them up there too long, just maybe a couple measures of that to create that big power surge and then I drop them back down a little bit, um, mainly because I want them to like my music and keep buying it because if you keep them out of their comfort zones too long, they don't wanna sing your music. If it's just a little bit where they feel that energy in those couple measures, even though they're uncomfortable, they can still appreciate that energy. It's, it works for a little bit. Okay, number four. Choosing a key signature is one of the first and biggest decisions you will make when writing your piece. And that is, that is the truth. I, the first, my first decision is who am I writing this for? My second decision is always what key am I going to put this in? Because that ties right in with your sweet spots. If you get the wrong key, you're not gonna have that really big power moment when you want it because nobody's in their sweet spot. Or if you have the key signature too high, it's gonna be too much energy all of the time because the vocal ranges determine where you're getting your energy from. And so um, if you have it too low, if you have the key signature too low, you end up with not enough energy. So the key signature is really important when you're writing music. Number five, good hooks make good songs. That's more of a business thing. <laughs> um, sometimes people have sent me music to critique, 
And there is nothing technically wrong with it. Their harmonies are correct, you know, their part writing is good. Um, you know, everything, everything technically is okay. But after I listened to the song, after I played through it, I couldn't sing any little phrases back to you. There was nothing that stuck in my head because there was not a hook to grab onto. And so, um, if you're writing choral anthems, if that is something that you're interested in, if you're writing a vocal solo, good hooks make good songs. Um, from a business standpoint, I always try to make sure that I give a hook to something. Um, do you guys understand what a hook is? Okay. From a, a believer's standpoint, I don't want to over-spiritualize this because it's not in the Bible, but <laughs> from a believer's standpoint, when someone sings something of mine in the church service, I want the congregation to go away keeping that little hook stuck in their head all week, not because I want them to remember my song, but because I want that truth to live on with them all week. Yes? Is it similar to the theme? I know, I know what a hook is, but I'm just trying to give it a Yes, it's, a, it's when... Um, so you have an opening theme like I guess yesterday, I would, I'm thinking of your song, uh, God of Heaven. Mm -hmm. You have that repeated. Da, 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 da. And I use that over and over, over and, and over. over again, right. mm -hmm. And some songs, your hook is going to be more uh, more present, but that is the hook. That's a melodic hook that just happens over and over and over in the song. Okay, yeah. And so when people walk away, they're thinking, da, 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 da. Um, or raise your hands, raise your hands, which happens over and over in the song, and then it follows it, you know, there's a different why you should raise your hand after every one of those, or I lift my eyes into the hills. You know, that's kind of the thing that gets stuck in their head. It's that, that little phrase that draws you in. Um, okay, number six. This was a freeing moment for me when I learned this. I don't have to do things the same way that other writers do. I'm a morning writer. I'm most creative and most concise in the mornings. And so I protect my morning hours to write music. I know that if I write something in the afternoon, I will just sit and stare at a computer screen. If I'm on a deadline, I'll put something on paper. And the next time I sit down in the morning, I'll go back and delete those last you know, 20 measures because they just weren't good. So I do it differently than some people. I also know that I'm a better writer when I do it in segments rather than I'm going to write a song today and I just sit down at the computer all day. Um, I know a lot of people, most people in the world, will write the text and add music to it. Or they will borrow a text from someone and then create the music to it. I did it opposite of that for the first, I don't know how many years that I wrote music. I did it. Um, I did it music first, and then I would go in and I would create text for that, which is by far a harder way to do it. But that's the way my mind worked. And as I have worked at becoming a lyricist, um, for years I wouldn't write lyrics. I so thought, oh, I can't do that. I'm not a lyricist. <laughs> um, actually, for years I would not call myself a composer. I mean, this was after I had pieces on the bestseller list, and I still, I would not call myself a composer because I thought that there were so many other people who were worthy of that title, more worthy of that title than I was, and I had to, music, music comes very easily to me. Writing music, writing harmonies comes very easily to me. I can do it in my sleep. Um, I can arrange in my sleep. You get me on my worst day, I'm running 104 fever, I can crank out an arrangement for you that's publishable. <laughs> might not be my best work, but it will still work. However, um, writing lyrics was not that way for me. I, I, I would pray over my lyrics for days, and I would work at them for a week or two, whereas like Joe will just spend a text in five minutes in the airport. <laughs> um, and I thought, I can't do that. I have to pray so hard for the text that God gives me, and I have to work so hard at it that truly I should not call myself a composer. And churches were having me in as a composer, and I always thought, oh no, what if they find out I'm not really a composer, <laughs> you know? And then one day God kind of gave me the spiritual spanking. He said, Heather, you are a composer because I have called you to be a composer. And all of the work that you put into it and all of the prayer that you put into it, that is part of my plan for your life. So, you know, I kind of got over that. But um, I, I'm so off 
base here. What am I talking about? Oh, I don't have to do things the same way that other people do them. If you, um, if your approach to writing is very different than everybody else you know, that is fine. Um, and that works great. Just, just go with the way that it works for you. Um, learn to trust, this is number seven, learn to trust your instincts. And um, when I first started writing for the industry, you know, it was usually on assignment. They would call me up and say, hey, would you arrange this or would you write this? And I would edit my natural creativity. I would, I would downplay it and I would kind of... Um, do a washed out version of myself because the chords that come naturally to me, the chord progressions, the thoughts, the creativity that comes naturally to me, I didn't see anyone else in the industry using that same chord structure or using the same little lips that were so natural to me. And I thought, well, here they are, here's the greatest of the greats, and they're not doing any of these things. It's probably for a good reason, so um, I'm going to put a little bit of that in there, but um, I, I was very hesitant. I had no confidence in that at all. And then as editors and publishing companies and people, consumers, started responding to that, I realized that other people weren't writing those, not because they weren't good, that just wasn't their voice. You know, and those were the things that made my voice as a writer unique. And so then I started embracing those, and that's where I cut out my niche in the industry. You know, we all have our different styles of writing and arranging, and it just took me a little bit to realize that, hey, just because I do things very differently and I hear things differently, that doesn't mean that it's not acceptable. It's just different, and different is good. Um, one illustration of this is when I was writing God of Heaven, it starts, the whole song starts with um, an octave leap right at a woman's break point, and it starts with the women singing. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is when I was first starting out in the industry, and I thought, my editors are just going to shoot me down, and I don't want, at this point in my career, I don't want them thinking, what is she doing, you know? I, I want to build some confidence with them. And so yeah, I went back and forth and back and forth, and I thought, I just can't, I don't, I don't know that I can handle all the red marks coming back, so I'm going to change it. So I, this, is, this is, for those of you who are not familiar with this piece, it starts, um, and that's the hook throughout the whole piece. So I thought, I, I just can't do that. They're going to say, what is she doing? So I changed all of the octave leaps to all throughout the piece. The whole piece I did that. And it just killed me. Because that's not that's not the song that I that I wanted to write. And at the last second, as I was getting ready to hit send, I'm like, nope, no, I just have to go with what I really, really feel here. So I went back and changed it all back. And to my wonderful surprise, they loved the octave leap at the beginning. <laughs> so this because, it, this because it, it matches the vulnerability of the text. It's very ethereal. It's right. It right. did exactly what I wanted it to do. Yeah. And I had to learn over a couple of years to trust my instincts, even though, like the point ahead, it wasn't like anything anybody else was doing. Were you influenced by Wicked? Was that? I had not heard it. I don't know. I, I had not heard it at that point. No, that's, that's interesting now. Okay, there are two different reasons for arranging. One is to recreate and to reinvent something. The other is to format creatively for desired voicing. And um, know the difference between these two. Because, go ahead. I'm sorry, but how did you phrase the second one? Format creatively for desired voicing. Okay. I recreate things that have been around for a long time that everybody else has done a version of. If someone contacts me and says, hey, would you do an arrangement of Joy to the World? My first thought is, do we really need another arrangement of Joy to the World? <laughs> <coughs> uh, really? um, but then if I have a great idea, if I'm going to do a Joy to the World, I'm going to reinvent it a little bit. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to change the melody. It means that I'm going to change the perspective. Again, remember perspective. If I can... If I can shine light on joy to the world in a whole new way to make people think differently or 
maybe take away something that they've never taken away from Georgia of the World before. Okay, then I will do that. That's how I reinvent it and I recreate it. It's kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's early and I have not had enough coffee. Uh, like a remix kind of? Yeah. Um, so if, you know, I will, I will recreate. If someone says, we need a uh, Be Thou My Vision. Well, there are a thousand Be Thou My Visions out there. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to put a new spin on it. Um, that's as opposed to the song Blessings that came out a few years ago. Are you familiar with Laura Story's Blessings? Like the number one song, song of the year for, you know, whatever it was a couple years ago. When I first heard that, when it first hit the radio, first of all, I said, hey, <laughs> I want our company to be the first one out with that SATB arrangement. And we were. Because um, <laughs> I knew that that was going to be a huge, huge song. For, it's going to go down in history. It's, it's one of those that's going to stick around for, for forever. Um, but I also knew that what Laura's story did with it, as the artist version, was incredibly effective, and I did not want to mess with that. Um, so obviously I can't go and just lift everything that she did, um, because then, you know, that's just not good as copyright, and I don't, as an artist, I don't want to lift what someone else is doing either. But, um, I wanted to keep that exact same vibe. And so I formatted it creatively. I still put a little bit of my fingerprint in there with the accompaniment and the way I structured the chords. Um, so I still did it creatively, but I wanted to create an SATV version of it that still reflected the very vulnerable artist version of it. So know the difference between the two, know which one to use when. Yeah. Um. You familiar with David Phelps mm -hmm. and his rendition of uh, Oh Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't he wrote it for Gaither's family group. But the Westminster Chorus picked it up and, and sang it. Wonderful. In in one of the cathedrals that I'm not sure exactly where, but the acoustics were just incredible. I'm sure, yeah. So it's what you're talking about is what he did. He took that hymn and recreated it, basically, in his, his TTVB. Oh, very of, cool. Of course. I'll have to go and listen to it. But it, it just made the song. Awesome. It, well, that's the most just, beautiful text. I think that's probably my favorite in text right. ever. Just, oh, you guys need to go read those words. It's amazing. Number nine, good musicians often disagree. You said if you are interested in publishing um, at all, I don't know if that's any of you in here, so this is a mixed bag. I just kind of threw all of these thoughts into my big purse here. Um, good musicians often disagree. If you send something to one publishing company, uh, you're going to get a, mm, it's not what we're looking for. You send it to another company and it's their best seller. Um, you, if you have a panel of people critiquing your music, okay, this happened to me a couple years ago. We were doing a, a composer symposium in Atlanta. And it was me, Dan Forrest, Robert Sterling, Joe Martin and Keith Christopher, I think. We were sitting there on a panel. We were critiquing people's works. And as we went down the line of <laughs> critiques, we all disagreed with each other. You know, I love that. Oh, that really didn't speak to me. You know, the way that you did that was so creative. And yeah, I've heard it a hundred times. You know, <laughs> so um, good musicians are going to disagree. And just be aware of that as you're doing this. Now, if you get a lot of good musicians who disagree, who, who are all like, mm, you might want to look at that a little bit. You might just want to um, consider that maybe love is blind and that <laughs> you can't see it because this is your baby. You know, you spent a lot of work on that. So if you're getting a lot of the same feedback, then I would go back and look at it. But just because one person doesn't like something does not mean that it's not good and it's not effective. So keep that in mind if you go through a... Uh, a publishing process. Um, for the first couple of years, as when I was first getting my foot in the door, I was a yes person as much as possible. In fact, that was kind of my um, that was kind of my plan, my strategy. If I can say yes to something, I will. Now, there's sometimes you just can't say yes to something, and so don't don't just be a doormat. There were a few times when I said no to something, but if I can say yes to something. I will. So I, I, even if I disagreed with something at the beginning of my career, I went with it a little bit musically um, just because I wanted to build the reputation of being easy to work with and to be flexible and to have good working relationships with people. 
Now, the more brownie points I built up and the more successes I had with pieces, that built up a lot of trust with my company. So now I can go in and when somebody, one of my editors says, eh, would you really look at that measure again? I'm like, yeah, I know that, I knew that you were going to disagree with that, but I feel very strongly about that. And so I, I would like to keep it in there. And I have built up so much trust with them that um, they usually will allow something like that to go through. Um, number 10, edit thyself. The more I edit myself, the more successful that piece ends up being. Not, as, not in terms of sales, that's not what I'm talking about here, just in its presentation, how it sings with a choir. I have learned to listen to the inner nag. You know, as I'm, as I'm playing through something, and I'm hitting playback on finale, and I, I hear um, a little thing that I'm like, mm, that measure just kind of bothers me. You have to understand, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm, I'm going to kind of combine 10 and 11 here. Writing and arranging a successful piece is usually a, a, a series of decisions and compromises. Um, as, I'm, you know, as I'm hitting that playback and I'm listening, and there's something that just, eh, I really... I really don't like that, but I'm leaving it that way because of, I'm, you have to piece together songs and heart writing. Heart writing is just a puzzle. It's a huge puzzle. And sometimes you have to choose uh, the lesser of two evils every now and then. Um, you know, I, I, am I going to put the tenors out of range just a little bit to create the most gorgeous chord ever? Or am I going to um, have the basses do the slightly awkward leap so that you know they can sing it and use them in the sweet spot or something and so that i like i said writing and arranging music is just a series of decisions and compromises and trying to fit puzzle pieces together especially in choral music and so um edit yourself so a lot of times when i that little nag i have learned that if there's a little nag in my head that uh, that's the part of the song that is going to sing the least successfully <coughs> It's always going to be a hiccup with churches in reading sessions. That's the part that's not going to sing well. Um, and so I have learned to edit myself. The more I edit, the better the pieces. And um, usually, because I am a morning writer, if I'm editing in the evening hours, I make sure I, I get it where I think it's just perfect. I know that I'm a morning writer, though, so I'm going to let it sit overnight. I'm going to look at it in the morning, and all of those little trouble spots that I just think I might have fixed, usually all of the solutions are right there, first thing in the morning when I look at it. And if it's a particularly difficult piece that I've had to edit and edit and edit, um, I'll let it sit a couple days. And that's hard, because once you finish a piece, you, you know, our very first thought is, ooh, we need to send this off, send this off, send this off. And um, so that's that little angel. <laughs> That's not the angel that pays the bills. You've got this little angel over here <laughs> that's saying, hmm, it needs to sit a little bit more, you know, and this is the wiser angel. This is the angel who understands um, music a lot more, okay? Number 12. Avoid cliche at all costs, unless it's a blatant reference, and you all know this, um, and yet this is the biggest Mishap is not the word I'm going for. What's a good word? This is the biggest downfall, maybe, that I see in people who are um, budding writers or people who want to write, people who are kind of cutting their teeth. Uh, even some people who have been doing it a little bit, I feel like we are a little bit cliche sometimes. Unless it's a blatant reference. Fine, it's kind of going back to look at the truth from a different perspective. Um, Keep that in mind, because that's the best way to not be cliche. Because like we said earlier, your journey is not like anyone else's journey. And so your perspective on anything, even the truth that doesn't change, your perspective on it is always going to be unique. Um, I say unless it's a blatant reference. There was a song I wrote a couple years ago called Lullaby Prayer. And it blatantly references Jesus loves me. Bless these little children, Lord, tiny souls, so, so adored. Little lambs to you belong, for they are weak, but you are strong. And then the song keeps going on. It wasn't like, oh, that's a cool phrase that I want people to think I wrote. I wanted people to tie Jesus loves me 
to make that connection with this song. And so that was a blatant reference. But other than that, I hear so many people using the same phrases over and over again. It's because these are phrases that we've heard. You're not digging deep enough. Um, as a personal rule, I will not write a song that uses the word overcome. <laughs> because every, every major recording artist in the last seven years has sung a big song that uses the word overcome. They're all writing overcome. And there's nothing wrong with that word. That is a great truth. You know, Christ has overcome so much for us. And we can overcome through Christ. And yet, because everybody else is using that word, I just refuse to use it in anything that I write. Now, I have had a copyright assignment where someone handed me a, my publisher handed me um, a song that was already, a contemporary song that was already written, you know, sung by a famous artist and said, will you arrange this? And I'm like, oh, sure, I'll do that. But in my own actual composition, I just refuse to use that word. <laughs> so don't do what everybody else is doing. So many tired phrases are being used over and over and over again. Number 13, matching text and music. Um, something that will really make your music communicate is if you will take the actual lyric phrase and match it up exactly with the musical phrase, and I'll demonstrate this in a minute. Hymns do not do a good job of this, because hymns, a lot of times the text was written, and then a tune was assigned, where everything falls, and in the, the larger phrases, there's a cadence that works, but a lot of times you'll see a little musical phrase where the lyric phrase continues on, um, and it's fine. And we, st we still do that in writing music some, but the more that you can make your actual musical phrases and lyric phrases match up, the better people are going to lock into what you're doing. And here's an example of this. The little lullaby prayer that I was talking to you about before, I wanted, I wanted it to feel very simple, where it was just little phrases that people would latch on to. Um, I think this is the key. Just these for this song because it's a little lullaby um, but you notice how every lyric phrase ended at the exact same time that the musical phrase does and it communicates so much better if you can do that often in your pieces not you don't have to do it the whole piece but if you really want a phrase to stand out have it exactly match the musical and the lyric phrase right there 